Welcome to No Filter. I'm Mia Friedman. Annabelle Crabb can make anything interesting. I'm not kidding. Whether she's making Corey Bernardi seem human or making paella with some backbencher you've never heard of on her hit show Kitchen Cabinet or explaining some obscure baking technique in her cookbooks or recapping the daily goings-on in Canberra that seem to make no sense until Annabelle makes sense of them. She's one of the most smart and delightful human beings on the planet. Like most beloved famous people, Annabelle is exactly the same person in real life, except she swears a little bit more. But she has actually brought me homemade jam in an actual jar when she came to my house. That's what she's like. And when she came into Mamma Mia to talk about her new ABC show, The House, more about that in a moment, we decided to turn the tables and presented her with some homemade Greek shortbread biscuits made by Maria, the 85-year-old mother of Vicky, who makes videos here at Mamma Mia. Anyway, back to why Annabelle's here. Apart from being the author of one of the non-fiction books I quote in conversation more than any other, if you haven't read it, I highly, highly recommend it. It's called, of course, The Wife Drought, Why Women Need Wives and Men Need Lives. Annabelle's new six-part series on the ABC is about, wait for it, Parliament House. As I say to Annabelle at the start of this interview, I wasn't excited when I first heard about the show, but after watching it and her, I changed my mind. I swear you will be riveted, not just by the show, but by hearing her talk about it here. Take it away, Annabelle. Okay, what are we even talking about? We're talking about in the, the house. Okay, great. <laughs> all right. I just never. No. I know. I didn't even say. I know. That's all we're right. We're talking I about come the house. anyway. <laughs> you know exactly. When I heard that you were doing this, yeah, I was a little bit. <laughs> what a stupid idea. <sighs> well, a little bit like I feel sometimes about Tony Abbott. Like, does he have no one in his life that can just tap him on the shoulder and say? Do you really think this is a good idea? <laughs> so it's like eating an onion for you. Yeah, yeah you just thought, it is. So, okay, so why did you think it was a bad idea? Because I thought it was the most boring topic in the world. Yeah, yeah, right. I did. And I know that you're a political nerd. Yes. And so, but I also thought, in my heart, I thought you could, you know, probably do some, do a, do a, a six-part series about paint drying or about, because oh, I texted love. you my baths, <laughs> me doing my baths, and make that riveting. <laughs> and indeed, so I watched... The first episode is a favour. Thanks. To oh. our friendship. And it was bloody fantastic. And now I'm riveted. <laughs> Forget Game of Thrones. I'm like, when is the next episode going to drop? Well, I did look, I did have a little bit of a wobble. I mean, it's taken us a year to make, and it's been a really full on year because we've had, we've just been there a lot. And it's a six part series of half an hour each episode. And I would say that we probably have. 500 hours of footage at least like I mean and part of it is you've just got to you've got to get everything to get the little bits of gold you've got to really you know search through it all sieve it all out and find the little bits of excellentness that you can weave into a story that's sort of worth watching or interesting but the other week just before it went to air was the week where the whole postal plebiscite happened. And there was just this sort of, even more than usual, a sense of just people ripping their hair out and being unimpressed about Mm. what goes on in Parliament House. And I did think, I mean, it was too late to change our minds now, but I think, God, why have we spent a year making a television program about a house, a building that everybody wants to blow up right now? But I think that's why it's so interesting, because it's like you do explain some of the baffling things that everyone thinks they should be across, which right. I'll get to in a second. But mm. I want to know how you pitched this. Look, we were assisted mightily by the fact that the BBC had made a um, program called Inside the Commons in the Palace of Westminster. Now, um, Which also sounds boring. Oh, so good, though. It's so great. Why love, is it? Why? Because it's, it's the most it's freaky building. I mean, it's this sort of incredible Gothic pile that still has the blood of executed kings on its floor. Like, I mean, a lot of shit has gone down in that building, right? And I was talking with Madeline Horcroft, um, who is the producer who makes Kitchen Cabinet um, with me and our friends Damatia Maripas, who's the director on Kitchen Cabinet. And we watched a couple of these Inside the Commons things and we thought we've got to 
try and get inside Parliament House. Now, the reason why the BBC series was strategically important was because we get a lot of our traditions from Westminster, right? Mm. So they are like a precedent factory. And the fact that Westminster, the most august Westminster building uh, on the globe, would let a documentary team in to film was like a really important um, weapon in our arsenal for our, you know, approach to our Parliament House. It's like, well, you know, the the Brits have done it. Mm. Why can't we? And that was a really important thing. I think it stopped them from kicking us out the door right away. Parliament- who is them? Like, who gets to decide? Ah, is it the them. Prime Minister? No, it is not the Prime Minister. Parliament House is like this territory that's ruled by a series of feudal overlords. It's... It's complicated, right? So you've got the Department of the Senate and the the sort of head of that department is the, the president of the Senate. There's also the clerk of the Senate who basically runs the place practically. These aren't elected officials. These well, are public the, the servants. The president is, uh, is an elected senator who gets elected by the chamber to basically be the chair of the meetings. But is he a politician? Yes, he is. Yeah, oh. yeah his name's Stephen Parry and he is a liberal senator from Tasmania. Huh. And in his prior life, he was a cop and then an undertaker. So oh he's just perfect. But anyway, I digress. Then you have the Department of the House of Representatives and the sort of head of that is the Speaker, Tony Smith. Mm-hmm. But they also have a clerk and they have the Sergeant at Arms. The Senate has the Usher of the Black Rod. So these the- are all these people whose names and titles and often modes of dress are bonkers. bonkers. The Usher of the Black Rod is so awesome. She was the first female Usher of the Black Rod and people just call her Black Rod in conversation. Black so Rod. they'll be like, you know, well, Black Rod wants to see you in her office. And you're thinking, <laughs> is this some sort of sex game? <laughs> and she's an actual person. She is an actual person. Her real name is Rachel Callanan. What's well, her job? In the olden days, in Westminster, the usher of the Black Rod was kind of like the enforcer for the Senate. That's why um, they carry a stick. And in the an old days, they used to carry a sword as well. Because, you know, in the ancient formative days of the Westminster parliamentary system, There was all this really bad interference being run by monarchs Mm. to the extent when that, you know, monarch would occasionally like storm into parliament and start chopping people's heads off or... Like Donald Trump. Right. It's it's exactly like what Donald Trump would have been like in the 1600s. (laughs) And so, for instance, I mean, fun fact, well, anti-fun fact, whatever, (laughs) the Governor General of Australia is not allowed physically to walk into the House of Reps chamber. That's why they have the whole opening of parliament in the Senate chamber because and poor has to old Peter in. Cosgrove is the only person in Australia who is not allowed to walk into the House of Reps chamber. And that is because in 1642, I think, about 400 years ago anyway, King Charles forced his way into the lower house, the House of Commons in Britain, and started demanding that um, people be handed over to him and so on. And since then... Parliaments have decreed that it is not cool for monarchs to enter the lower house because of the separation of the crown and state, right? So we observe that tradition, even though it's so crazy. Mm. It's one of those things that we hold on to. Like there are so a many crazy rug. things yeah. that you uncovered, which was just a lot of it seems to happen at the beginning of, is it? A sitting session or at the beginning so, of a term? A so it's the beginning term. of a new parliament. So right. um, our first episode is about um, all of these newbie politicians turning up, some of whom have got no experience in politics whatsoever, like Anne Alley, who first is day like school. new to the Labor Party, new to parliament, a little bit like she's an academic, she's just not versed in the ways of politics at all. Darren Hinch. And in fact, yeah, that's right. She, he's like, well, I'm a journalist and a jailbird. <laughs> what, what do I do next? <laughs> um but and Anne Alley is just this great character. She just grows over the course of the series. And you really understand what it would be like if you were just like a normal person who's suddenly in Parliament. You're like, what? And I have to go, where? What? She cries in the last episode, um, which is a really – you just want to give her a hug. She's so confused about how to – 
behave in this new role in some ways. But anyway, so I'm like up to episode two where she's right. picking artwork for oh my her God. office. She's so funny. There's a third authority I should mention too. There's a group called the Department of Parliamentary Services, and they kind of run the operations of the building. They're not mm. really hooked into the Senate or the reps. They run the restaurants, the cafes, the security. They are in charge of the art collection, which is presided over by the fabulous woman Justine mm. Van Murick, who lives underground with all of these artworks and, you know, explained to me the terrifying thing about the coat of arms, which has really affected the way you that I to, see the you building. You have to explain what that is. So I'm interviewing Justine because um, I'm obsessed with political portraiture, right? And I know that this, you know, I promise there's not that much of this in the series, but... Well, it's quite interesting, it is, this bit. Yeah, so when speakers and presidents of the Senate and prime ministers leave their jobs, usually because they've been executed in a democratic way, <laughs> parliament commissions a portrait of them. And there are some portraits lying around in the parliamentary collection that were commissioned and then the subject didn't like. So there's this one of Sir John Kerr that was um, commissioned of him uh, after he left office, you know, after his rather sensational term in office, which included dismissing the government of Gough Whitlam. And the first portrait that they commissioned, he just hated. And they were so ashamed of it that they kept it wrapped up in the Senate and they didn't know what to do with it. They just commissioned a new painting and it was never seen again. But Justine's got it down in her in her dungeon. And so while I was there, I was looking at some other things that she has. She showed me um, some lovely drawings, beautiful technical preparatory drawings for the big coat of arms at the front of the building. You mm. know the big silver one? It's mm. the one that all of the protesters like handcuff themselves to yes. when they climb up the top of the... <laughs> it's lovely. It's so, it's got lots, so many bits that you can cuff yourself to. Yes. Very handy. Um, anyway, she was showing me the drawings and she was talking about some of the other coats of arms, you know, around the building. They did, as they did for many aspects of Parliament House, sort of public tenders and competitions and artists actually just profited so much from the building mm. of Parliament House because it's just like a giant art work gallery of in a way. craft. Human yeah. art. So many woodworkers mm. were, you know, were um, able to work profitably for many years. Anyway. The benches um, alone. Oh, that, the benches. The stories are oh, yeah. Don't start me okay. on the benches. Um, so uh, one quite famous Australian artist, John Coburn, put in a design for one of the coats of arms and apparently it was rejected on various grounds, including the design problem with it, which was that the design did not fill the requirement for the kangaroo on the coat of arms to be visibly male. So we're talking about a kangaroo scrotum. We are, and that was a serious design issue. Apparently, <laughs> it is not cool <laughs> to have your country represented by a lady roo. It has to be a bloke, otherwise we all feel a bit slightly less protected. Yeah. It's very true. It's weird, I would have it? loved to be in that in those meetings. I imagine there were many of them. Oh my god. When that was discussed. But there's so many great things about the design of the building. I promise not to go on and on, but like it really it's quite a rare building How because big is it? it is uh it's got 19,000 square meters of parquetry. Oh wow. I know, right? And like 10 kilometers of corridors. Yes, correct. Most of which you can't take a camera into normally, by the way. Like you Why? Can, because there's just all these restrictions. It, it, a couple to of, protect who? To protect the people who work in there. I think that... From what? From us. From the media, basically. So if you work in the press gallery, and, and the building is weird um, because it's one of the only parliaments in the world that has the press living in. So the press gallery runs along the second floor of the Senate side of the building. They, the senators all identified as the messiest, loudest and least polite area of the building because so there's the, like trolleys and shit everywhere. The journalists are all together, are they? Yeah, we are. In, we've got so a, it's like we, camp. We've got our own corridor, right? So there's newspapers up one end and there's TVs up the other end and in the middle are sort of like nervous podcasters and people who work for websites. So each media organisation has an office Correct. and has press credentials and that's yep. where – so you've got – who have you got sitting next to who? Have you got Laurie Oakes sitting next to Mark Riley sitting next to Barry Cassidy? No, Laurie has got his own office because he is a god, right? But in the News Limited office, you'll have, you know, Dennis Shanahan and then the, um, like, it's all the News Limited people all in together, right? So they are sort of raucous, loud. And at the other end is the ABC and Channel 7 and Channel 10 and SBS. 
and I think the West Australian is up the other end and the Guardian is up the other end. But look, the interesting thing about that corridor is you're allowed to wave cameras anywhere you like in our corridor. So that's why when you watch the TV, you see a lot of footage of politicians walking along a corridor towards an interview, you know, like yeah. that's oh. one of the only areas where we're allowed to film them walking, right? Because the rest right. of the building, they can walk around and if we pull out a camera, then you'll have seriously the, the um, usher of the black rod coming to Hit beat you? you with the rod, yeah. Can you get kicked out? Does that you ever can, happen? can because the parliament controls all of our parliamentary passes. So if you break the rules, then you're out on your ass. Um, so, in fact, what, one of the things that happened while we were filming was a change in this ancient rule about photography in the Senate. Now, the strange thing about Parliament House up till now is that photographers are allowed to photograph whatever they want in the House of Reps chamber. So if, you know, Tony Burke is picking his nose or something mm. and thinks he's, you know, unobserved foolish in mm. a parliamentary mm. chamber anyway, um, you can narrow in on him and snap away if you want. Somebody going to sleep up the back, all that sort of stuff. Or, you know, wow, why are those two people talking to each other? You can snap a picture of those people mm -hmm. talking. Up till now, the Senate has been really strict on photography rules, totally different from the House of why? Reps. You're only allowed to photograph people who are on their feet and making a speech. Oh. So, so everyone else can have a, have a nap. Right, or pick their nose yeah. or streak across the chamber. Yeah. Now, in this, in this particular environment we're now in, it becomes really significant because you've mm. got the biggest crossbench in the Senate you've ever had. You've got Pauline Hanson in there. You've got Darren Hinch in there. You've got Jackie Lambie, all of the Greens, all of the Nick Xenophons. The deals that are being done in the Senate have never been more interesting and complicated. And yet... As a photographer, you can't photograph any of that happening. Who's talking to whom? I mean, often when like highly contested bits of legislation go through the Senate, there's all sorts of people with their heads together. It's fascinating. It's like being at the zoo watching what's happening in that mm. chamber. But these poor photographers are just like, all I can do is photograph the person yeah. who's actually on their feet and speaking. So... There was a really big push while we were filming by the press gallery and President Andrew Mears. He decided he was going to take that rule all the way to the High Court as a freedom of political he speech. He just also happens issue. to be a photographer, right? Like the best photographer yes, he in does, Australia. Yeah. yeah, and you know Michael Bowers has also been working mm. on this for a long time, and it would take a vote of the Senate to change this rule, and habitually. Basically, all the senators are like, oh, yeah, no, totally agree with you, but just, yeah, yeah. just not going to actually draft that bill myself <laughs> because then all my friends in the Senate will be like, well, what? hate me. No, we can't I can, sleep I anymore. I can't pick my nose or be drunk yeah. or, you know, sleep. And what happened, like the tipping point, and this happens um, in one of our episodes, we captured it, um, was that when Darren Hinch arrived in the Senate, Andrew's just gone around to see him and Hinch is on. What? What do you mean you can't take pictures? That's bonkers. It's different mm. from the House of Reps mm. and like Why should it screw be? that. So he just drafts a motion and puts it in and basically the whole Senate's just gone, oh, yeah, fair cop. So that has now changed, which wow. is now why you can see pictures of, you know, Pauline Hanson in the Senate. Hanson is a really tricky customer because she hardly ever does any interviews. So really the only chance you have to photograph her. I you feel can't like I always hear her. Is that just the sound of her voice in my head? Well, you hear her in in the chamber normally. She doesn't do that many interviews. Well, she doesn't do any interviews with the ABC. <laughs> Maybe that's I, I suppose she, my, say, I, I sort she does. Always she does. She does. Doing seven, little presses everywhere. Maybe out and about. You can't. She doesn't. She's Maybe hard to photograph. Them. She's like the snow leopard. Anyway, look, being able to photograph that stuff and record it is actually quite a big part of understanding mm. how these things work. So that has changed and that's been that's been a really great thing, I think. You know how you said you can't film them in the corridor? Yeah. So all the coverage that we always see yeah. around the time when they're rolling a leader, you know, every yep. two or three months. Yeah. Where's that? Is that the do they all just parade down the media corridor for show? No. What happens I mean it's so weird, right? There are some places where you can film in Parliament House, I should say. There's a couple of public areas. So quite often when you see people do door stops and stuff, that's yeah. in they're in the restricted public areas where it's okay to set up cameras and there's a couple of courtyards where it's okay to film people and you can film people in their office with their permission but mm -hmm. you can't film them walking down the corridor to their office I don't know it's just like mm -hmm. about 90% of the building is you know you're mm -hmm. not allowed to bring out a camera and start snapping but when there's a um, leadership vote and this is so funny 
the um, usher of the black rod and the sergeant in arms will confer and sometimes they will set up a media pen that is near the party room of the party that is currently... Rolling its lead up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to see people walking in and out. That is by special arrangement you're allowed to film at that time. But if you went back there the next day and started filming people walking past, you'd lose your pass. So it's (laughs) theatre. Well, you know, the building does respond to moments of great sort of Mm, stress mm. and tension. But there are massive, massive blues that happen when journos and camera operators kind of push the rules. There are big, big arguments that occur. But, you know, that's the building. You know, it's full of urgent business and people doing business contrary to each other's interests, you know. So there's a great capacity for Biffo there. Yeah. You mentioned the doors. That was something I really enjoyed learning about in in, yeah. in episode two or maybe episode three. Can you explain the door, okay, how the, the doors work? You know how when you see on television sometimes, um, particularly in the mornings, mm. you'll see somebody arriving, like getting out of their com car and walking up and sort of being caught by the cameras, yeah. you know, Daniel Plibersek, what do you think about blah, blah? And, you know, um, is Katie Gallagher a foreign citizen or whatever? Like, you know, people <laughs> shouting questions about the issue yeah. of the day. And looks and like, stop it looks and like they've just been sort of, yeah, caught on their way to work. And it runs a lot of the daily news, you know, um, these grabs. It's all orchestrated, basically. So most of the TV networks will have someone specially on duty to be at the Senate door or the House of Reps door early in the morning to catch people as they're coming in. But often political parties will also roster particular MPs and senators to be on duty, to be the person who expresses a view about, you know, X, Y, Z, news story that's broken overnight and what will often happen with those people is they'll come in super early through the car park have their briefing with their leaders media team and then go out and then arrive again for the cameras fully prepped and ready to go it's so funny and bizarre and also there's this real kind of you know that old cartoon um the Warner Brothers cartoon about the sheepdog and the like yeah. the wolf, yeah. you know, and the sheepdog is guarding the sheep against the Thinking wolf, you know. It. And then at the end of the day, they're like, they clock night off. Ralph, yeah. night Sam. <laughs> and they yeah. just like, see you in the morning. And it's like that because even the um, political protagonists that you see, and they actually literally line up waiting for their chance to address the, the media pack. And they're kind of, you know, yeah, what are you up to today? Nothing much, you know, blah, blah, blah. They're all super friendly. It's a really funny, interesting thing to di- see. And so all we did was just pull the camera back a bit further and show you what was actually going on. And on that particular, we had this one day where we f- tried to film everything that happened on the lead up to question time. And it was this big day where the 18C amendments were going through the um the coalition party room so there was a lot happening and we were following Linda Burney who came in she's a Labour front bencher she came in at you know 5.30am or something got herself totally briefed left the building and then re-entered it by way of the media scrum and had some very you know crisply prepared remarks to make about racial discrimination I wanted to ask (laughs) you more about the relationship between the opposing parties I imagine all working there together there must be some real friendships that that emerge between people in different parties and and sometimes maybe between journalists. I'm not using that as a euphemism for for anything. (laughs) Special (laughs) friendships. Special friendships. Well, look, yes and no. I think that that was very much the case in the old Parliament House because – and this is where you get a reminder of how much design um, makes a difference to the way people work and the way that they live and the way that they relate to other people because in the old Parliament House it was so overcrowded that sometimes MPs were like two or three to an office. You know, they were sharing accommodation. Mm. Also, in their cramped little corridors, they'd have like ministers and backbenchers all together. And you couldn't, there weren't toilets in the offices. So if you went out for a a wee, Mm. you'd run into somebody, you know, there was a much more close and um, cramped environment. You could not avoid your enemies either. So you had to find a way to... Get along with them. I suppose plus without electronic communication, right. there was just by I'll, nature more hand-to-hand that's combat right. and conversation. And then they'd all repair to the non-members bar. And also, mm. you know, you couldn't get around the building without running into somebody else. So it was very, very intense, I think. New Parliament House, I mean, it's 30 years old, so not that new, but it's much bigger. 
it is much more spread out mm. and everybody has their own suites which includes staff their own personal office and they all have lots of bathrooms in their suites so they they really don't have to leave except to go and vote in divisions and you can really I mean Malcolm Turnbull when we talked to him said look you know we can I could I can go for weeks without running into Bill Shorten really yeah I mean, you see him over the dispatch box, but yeah, and but not bump into each other in the no at the urinal and, exactly. <laughs> and I mean, so this is my private obsession, right? And like you know, you asked for it, so now I'm going to give Bring you my theory. On. I think that we should remove the plumbing from um, parliamentarians' offices and make them use communal toilets again, because mm. if you run into someone by accident, you're much more likely to have a random conversation that somehow goes somewhere. And I know this, like, I've worked in Parliament House as a journalist and I've sort of commuted back and forth and, you know, worked remotely like lots of women. Every time I have a baby, I change the way I work. And, you know, for the last 10 years, I've been in a place where I haven't, you know, been at Parliament House full time. But when you are, it's really more productive because, not because of what you can sort of watch in the chambers but of because of the random accidental conversations you have mm. when you run into somebody in the lunch line and you start off talking about, well, yeah, this salad doesn't look very good and then before you know it, you've learnt something really interesting about mm. something that's going on that's so it's, totally it's, unconnected. So it's, it's the physical manifestation of the bubbles that we all live in, right? Right, yeah. It's yeah. The, yeah it's where, where do I get my random... Yeah occurring thought that has happened because I'm having a completely bizarre conversation, conversation. that isn't designed With or planned. Jackie Lambie in the Yeah. And it's not because basin. I've made an appointment to talk to this person at this time. It's just like we've just found out ourselves next to each other. Coming up, Annabelle talks to me about work strife balance. But first, here's something you might be interested in. Here at Mamma Mia, our purpose is to make the world a better place for women and girls. So here's an unsponsored message from our heart about a charity we love that's also trying to make the world a better place for women and girls. When you were a kid, did your parents read you a bedtime story? For children in the foster care system, it's sadly not always the case. Luckily, there's the Pajama Foundation. They send pajama angels into homes, match them with a child in care where they read books and spend time with them. For foster children, a friendly face and this very small act can be a life changer. If you'd like to be a reading angel or to find out more about their life-changing work, go to thepajamafoundation.com. Yep. You mentioned um, a moment ago being a mother and mm. flying in and out mm. of Canberra. Um, what, uh, being a woman, whether you're in the media or How you're a politician... you are, Mia. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Yeah, woman. I'm yep. investi- investigative. <laughs> no. um, how, how hospitable is is the house and the the you know mechanics of of Canberra to women and particularly to women with children? Well, not very. Um, it's changed a lot. So in 1998, when Anna Burke was elected, she was a bit surprised to be elected, and she was a bit like, "Oh, holy shit! I was going to have kids," you know. <laughs> And then she thought, I might just do that anyway. So a year or two later, she got pregnant and she became, in 1999, I think her kid was born, or 2000, only the second woman in the history of the House of Representatives to give birth to a baby while serving as a member of the House of Reps, which is so jarring, isn't it? Because Mm. you think, well, those guys have just been breeding in the cabinet room like ferrets Mm. for a century, a whole century, and nobody thinks... Oh, good on you, or whatever. But you know, a woman has a baby in the House of Reps, and people are like, "Oh my God!" It was like, it was very hard for her because there was no facilities. All of the parliamentary authorities were just like, "What? What do you mean you need a crib? What?" I remember Natasha Stotis Boyer saying that when she uh, came back, someone asked her for a schedule of when her baby would need to be (laughs) breastfeeding, so they could. Factor it in. Right, yes. And so everyone's trying to be helpful, but also a bit just like, oh, my God. Yeah, Yeah. right. And in 2007, Nicola Roxon became the first woman ever to serve in Cabinet with a preschool-aged child. Like, the first. Wow. How weird is that, right? And now, see, now there are lots of women that have babies while serving in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. It is tricky because... 
Because no one lives in Canberra. Right. And, I mean, the first woman ever to have a baby in the House of Representatives did live in Canberra. So, mm. you know, it was more um, it was more feasible for mm. her, but it still wasn't easy. But how do you do um, it and how do the other women do it? See, I had my first baby in London then I came back to be the sketch writer for the Sydney Morning Herald. And we were based in Sydney and I drove back and forth to Canberra and stayed in a motor inn that had a little, like, little apartments with kitchen and um, that was just full on yeah for how many days at a time would you do it three days three or four yeah um, and then when I had my when I was pregnant with my second baby I'm like eh, that's can't just two. can't do it too too hard but you know I mean so that's poli- when you pulled the pin and that's when got I went out of Canberra to, that's when I went to work for the ABC mm. to work to write digitally um, so you didn't have to be in Canberra. Right. And also, um, I didn't have the newspaper deadline, which, Mm. you know, newspapers go to bed at the same time as children and they Mm. have a comparable degree of emotional maturity. So it doesn't, it's hard, right? Anyway, so, um, but I would see, like, if I flew, Tanya Blubasek had three babies while she was serving as uh, a federal member and she breastfed her babies until about 12 months. Like, she was. A ninja, and mm. so like I would very regularly. Her kids about the same age as mine, a little bit older. Um, she didn't so take hers down to Canberra, though, did she? She did. Oh, she did. Correct. I thought she expressed. Okay, wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, Each I don't know if every week, but I used mm. to see her. You know, like she would get on the plane with a little baby strapped to her chest, and and she always says, "Look, you know, I'm very fortunate that I get. You know, I'm I'm the boss in that office too. So like, mm. you know, you can." I guess that um, she can set mm. um, an atmosphere of family friendly. You can establish the culture. Correct. As yeah. The boss. Yeah. And you, she also says, "Look, you know, there's some jobs where you just can't do this. Mm. Like if you're a bus driver or mm. you know, whatever." So, yeah. But I, I do think that the atmosphere in Parliament, and certainly the atmosphere among parliamentary spouses, like it is not unusual now to have like a woman in politics whose husband, father of her child, is like taking a year's paternity leave to, you know, to be the person who pushes the pram around and takes the baby in for, Mm. like, to be breastfed or whatever. And, you know, going back to Anna Burke um, in 2000, her husband, who was an ambulance officer in um, Victoria, has just gone, hey, 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 this is just so not working out. Like, there's no facilities. Anna's, like, losing her mind. The baby's tiny. I'm going to take parental leave for a year and mm. be there and do that, you know, do all that, be the helping person. And his employer just went, what? You don't know. You can't have parental leave. He's like, well, I'm a parent. And they were like, well, no, but that's for women. Ooh. And he said, well, where? Where does it say in this award that it's for women? It just says parents. I'm a parent. Here's the dictionary. And they backed down because mm. it was just that he was the first, you know, and they they were responding in this kind of like, what? No. Women do no, men don't do that. Just in the same way as the authorities at Parliament House are like, what? A baby? Huh? No, we don't do that. But do you know what? Everyone gets over it. It's just things change and people start to realise, well, that is actually not that crazy. That's what sparked you to write the wife drought, right? Yes, it is. So yeah. um, that idea of women needing wives and men needing lives. Mm. The idea of Anna Burke's husband having the option to take yeah. Uh, parental leave. Well, I, I mean, it really what that book was sparked by watching mm. the way that male and female politicians worked, you know. And I do think it is, I mean, I say that things are changing, but some things are really slow to change, like our attitude at a sort of deep and subterranean level to a man who leaves their family for like 18, 19 weeks a year mm. and goes to work in Canberra. Um, and isn't around at home is very different still from our attitude towards women mothers who do that. Like at a deep level, our expectations of what makes a good mother mm. are still very much about presence. Mm. And whereas what makes a good father is still it's consistent with absence. You can still be a great dad very and not, not be around. And and that is really interesting to me. And I think that is a major bulldog clip on the advancement of women in politics. They no, they women um, are sometimes reluctant to, to take on that career because they they suspect and with good grounds that people will 
judge them differently from the way they might judge, you know. And there are so many examples of that. I mean, you said that the tipping point was when you had your second. Yeah. You look at Natasha Stottespoia, that's when she left politics. Kate Ellis now. Yeah. There was a lot of conversation when she announced um, that that she wouldn't be contesting next election because she was having her second child. How did you feel about that? I felt less outraged. Yeah, I didn't feel outraged either. Because I just thought, like, you know, time passes, right, and people – these days we'll do a bunch of different jobs you've over got to the make course ch- of And their- also you've got to make choices. Yeah, you do. And it's like – I remember when Nicola Roxon left politics and, um, you know, she resigned, retired, and it was after the Labor government had lost power and, mm. and people were just like, see – you can't have it all, love. That's that's Nicola Roxon demonstrating that you can't have it all. I'm just like, give the woman a break. Like she's been in politics for I don't know how many years, a long time, and she's been a minister in all these senior portfolios. She's had an absolutely cracking career, and now she wants to go have another one. Like, yeah. what? Like, that's not a failure. She's a triumph. And, you know, you've got to give people permission to actually live their lives and make the decisions that that suit them and I don't you know when Kate Ellis announced that she was retiring I just she did it in such a respectful way Mm. she thought it out really um she didn't rush into anything she said listen I'm telling you now so that you know out of fairness to my electorate and I mean I thought she just pulled it off with such grace and I think good on you and Good luck. Have a lovely ha- next, next job. Yeah. I felt exactly so, the same way, that it wasn't a failure of feminism or it wasn't saying that women can't have it all. It's a choice that she made because of the logistics of Canberra, because of her husband's work that kept yeah. him in Adelaide. That's the choice that they made. It doesn't mean that her life is over or her career is yeah. over. It's just the next chapter. Yeah. And I think, you know, it is fair to say that the – pressures surrounding women in politics are such that they are more likely to make that decision. Yeah. So that is the structural issue. But I think you've got to be careful about, you know, making all of these women carry everybody's burdens, you know. Like you've got to you've got to if you love something, let it go, man. Like if you're all about not having rules uh, that attach to people's genders, then mm. you've got to take the crunchy with the smooth. And I think that what I find inspiring at the moment is watching that change happen that is about the basics, you know, like about male spouses not feeling weird and alone about being the guy who's pushing the pram or like, you know, that it is now a permissible thing for men to think about that they might change the way they work when they have children because women have been changing the way they work when they have children since, you know, ever since this sort of transformative feminist force started changing the way we do work. And um, there's been a lot of focus on that, on, you know, women moving into male-dominated fields and it not being weird anymore for a woman to have a job. Mm. I mean, it's only 50 years since women were obliged to quit their jobs in the public service when they got married. I mean, like, that's Mm. not very long ago. Mm. Women have changed a lot since then, but men, not really. I mean, no one expects men to change the way they work when they um, have a child the way that they expect women to. I think that's changing. I think it's changing gradually. Um, And I think one of the drivers of change of that is that big organisations, whether they're parliaments or, you know, big employers, are now, you know, formalising their expectation that men will behave in that way, that they might, you know, work flexibly. And partly that's, you know, a business decision, that if you have a workforce that is able to manage their work and family Mm. requirements better, it means that you have a workforce that is able to produce more work Mm. and is happier and more likely to stick around. And that's the thing that I find quite exciting too about the change in the way workplaces now think about gender balance. For For a very long time, you know, gender equity was something that, you know, mad-eyed Kathy, the feminist in, you know, HR or whatever, like ye- yelled about. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. in newspapers, I know you'd have like, oh, there's the feminist, you know. It was very niche. Yeah, you'd be like, oh, I'm the feminist. Yeah, you know, I would like there to be equal representation of women in this editorial meeting. And a crash. Or in the, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and, you know, because it's fair, because it would be more fair if there were more women involved in decision-making roles or whatever. It's all about, like, it's not fair that men get all these opportunities and women don't. Now I think the debate is 
about fairness but about something else as well, which is about running a good business, you know. And in the last 10 years, I think there's been an enormous amount of research commissioned that has been very revelatory about whether it is a good business decision to have a board that's only got men on it. Mm. All the, I mean, it's not even, good for business. Everything, every study well, shows right. that. So diversity, to use the buzzword, is actually like a good business decision because you're making the most of the resources that you put into all of your people mm. and you're getting the best possible range of opinions. And all the research shows that those companies actually do better. Profit and yeah. benefit. So I'm a bit like... We should have gender equity just because it's fair, but it really doesn't do any harm and it really puts a rocket under businesses when they consider that it's not just fairer, but it's also a better business decision. So yeah. I think that is actually changing things, um, which I think, you know, great. I don't care why it's, it's easy. Happening. I agree. It's easier to argue that point than the <laughs> fair point. I was heavily influenced, as you know, by your book, um, The Wife Drought, for my book, it's Work Strife Balance. And I wanted to ask you... Yours is funnier, though. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, right. <laughs> I'm like, that's only because I quoted you. I wanted to ask you about what you think about about this infernal obsession that particularly women have with work-life balance. Well, I, half the time I'm crying and then, mm. you know, like it's just – I think life goes through all these different phases and sometimes it'll just be really hard because things are changing all the time and like particularly if you've got little kids or if you've got like a sick parent or like mm. – you know how there's those Strife. like little – Right. There's the points at which you're just like, I'm, you know, like this morning when I cried in Lincraft. (laughs) Only you. I cried in Lincraft because we're in the last week of our edit for this show. I've been locked in a cupboard with my workmates looking at constant um, footage of myself on camera asking stupid questions, like in my dumb, dumb voice, with my dumb, dumb face. Like I'm just, it's torture, right? So, and... A half-hour television program like this takes, I don't know, we do 30 drafts of each show, script, nipping and tucking. Is this the right picture? Like it's for a person person who is slapdash by nature, it is uniquely irritating, right? So we're sort of, we're tired, uh, strung out. My kids all had gastro last week, so we're all just... And then yesterday I I realised that I'm supposed to have constructed an outfit. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, uh, my daughter is supposed to be a Mario Kart figure for, and it was due yesterday. So I'm like, on my way. And it's not even book week. You've just survived book week. I know, and that was hard. Um, So I'm I'm like, I'm on the way to Mamma Mia. I'm going to like catch the train in, jump out, get into Lincraft. Who can find the door to Lincraft in the city? Not me. Um, (laughs) And then find two metres of pink felt and uh, I'm going to be late. So I had a little little bit of a meltdown. <laughs> you know, that's a real peak where you're yeah. just like, oh, yeah. can't handle this. But then, you know, an hour later, here I am having you a are. chat with you. I've got a lovely cup of tea. It's true. Vicky's brought me some lovely biscuits. Shortbread. So now I'm in clover. So, and life is a bit like that. You know, there mm. are, you've just got to kind of cry or shove your way through the bits that are hard in the expectation that it, things will be easier And to also just say bit. nobody has, when people see you on the television or watch your show or buy your cookbook or read your books oh, or listen to this podcast, well, they, there's this idea that you are this swan gliding across this, this river at all times, serene. Well, of course not. No. Of course not. And also, you, None of us are. If you, you, know, you get help from everywhere that you can, mm-hmm. whenever you can. And, you know... If you don't have an actual wife, then you've got to build one from spare human parts. We've all got lots of wives, parts. don't we? Yeah. Just jumping in here. If you found yourself crying in Lincraft, then I have a podcast for you. It's our family life podcast and it's called This Glorious Mess. Have you ever booked in for a mammogram and thought, yay, some time without the kids? Then this is the podcast for you. I'm Holly Wainwright. And I'm Andrew Daddo and I haven't done that. <laughs> Had I thought of doing that, I may well have. We are the hosts of This Glorious Mess, and it's the podcast for imperfect parents. Every week we bring you the best stories from the front lines of parenting and parenting advice straight from the experts. People are trying to really set their children apart. John and Mary is not good enough anymore. Jackson isn't good enough. It's got to be with a KXS in it. So grab a drink and send the kids to the neighbours because this is not for little ears. This Glorious Mess. It drops Fridays. Subscribe now in your favourite podcast app. I've got two more questions about yep. the show before I let you go yep. back to Crying your small dark room, dark room or crying in Lincraft. 
first is about the office of the Prime Minister, the actual office. So oh. you're in, you have a lovely um, sort of banter with Malcolm Turnbull yep. and, and you have a couple of instances where you have a long interview in his office which comes through the different episodes. I imagine you've been in that office when it's been inhabited by Abbott, by Gillard, by Rudd and by now by Malcolm. Yep, and by John Howard. That was when I and first arrived John in Howard. Parliament House was when he was How is it physically and the, the sort of everything around it different depending oh on the, the different so prime funny. ministers? That is a really good question. And um, <laughs> that place – so Parliament House was designed to incredibly strict specifications. It was designed by this amazing man called Romaldo Jurgela who won the design competition out of like – dozens of international firms. The opportunity to design a parliament Mm. from scratch was so exciting for all of these architectural firms because normally parliaments around the world are like in some old building that's barely Mm. fit for purpose and they tack on more bits. Like to actually design a building that is absolutely built for that Good purpose. Good for you, it's, Yeah, right. And also, fascinating, interestingly, half of this American design team that won the competition ended up moving to Canberra. Romaldo Jurgler to live moved there. to Australia. Yeah, fell, fell oh, in love yeah. with the place. And this woman called Pamil Berg, who's like the daughter of Idaho potato farmers and met up with Romaldo on some architectural gig. She's an Etruscan pottery expert. <laughs> she came over to help design. She did all the dealing with the craftspeople oh. who have done all the beautiful things like the wood artisans and so on. And one of the um, one of the most important offices in Parliament House is the Prime Minister's office and it's designed to a T. Like the furniture is handmade, the cloth on the chairs is hand woven by local artisans. Like there is, um, it is panelled with hewn pine, which is the most expensive wood in Australia. Um, and it's thick panelling too, so that it can be sanded and rebuffed over a 200 year period, wow. which is what Parliament House was designed to last, right? Um, and there is such a beautiful architectural feature too to that to that prime minister's office and then the cabinet office it is a rarely seen phenomenon that um if you walk in the prime minister's front door that goes from the courtyard and you go across to the cabinet, you can open the cabinet door and then open the door on the other side of the cabinet and then there's another door that goes out into the members' hall where that big fountain is and then there's another door that goes to the great hall which is where all the parquetry is and where they have the events and the big tapestry is and then you can open another door that goes out into the marble foyer which is the place that looks like an eucalyptus forest and it's full of Belgian marble and it's full of fossils as well. This is a funny little prawn fossil that every school kid that goes to Parliament House is showing. My daughter tomorrow. Sean the prawn. Yep. (laughs) Tell her to look out. Sean Sean the prawn. prawn. And then, so if you open up all those doors, you can see straight through the building. It is incredible. And does anyone do that? Well, Malcolm Turnbull does it for us in episode Ah. five. So tune in. It's quite spectacular. I totally lose my rag with excitement at this point, of course, because I've heard about this feature but never seen it. But anyway, so back to the Prime Minister's office. It was perfectly designed. But the thing is that every Prime Minister that goes in there wants to bring their own daggy furniture with them. (laughs) And so the designers of Parliament House, and they still have a huge amount of authority, these people, because every time they want to move, change something in Parliament, they have to get the permission of the original designers. It's Ah. like this... So you can't just, you know, have a couple of You can't put on a pergola outside that, yeah, (laughs) take that wall out. No, no. They've got actual authority. It's called the moral rights over the building. And this is seriously like if you want to change the font on a, um, you know, sign in the lift or something, it has to go through the approvals process. It is insane. Parliament House has its own font. So, you know, everything is regulated. So when the Prime Minister's change over... The new people are always like, all right, I'm going to bring in this sofa and I'm going to, you know, take a wall out. And they really, the poor old Parliament House people go berserk because they're like, no, 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 no. You can't. It's supposed to be, uh, no. So it started off with um, John Howard, of course, who said, I'm going to bring these Chesterfield sofas in. And the designers are like, no, no, uh, they won't match. Uh, no. And he's so like, he wasn't no. allowed. No, he was. He just said, bugger you, I'm bringing them anyway. And he brought Menzies' old desk in, which didn't match either. And it was just, he had those things around him for the whole time he was in office. And so every time a politician 
becomes prime minister. Yeah. They bring their own stuff like Malcolm Turnbull was like, I'm having a stand up desk and I'm also I need a big table for my giant teapot. So he found a table up in the library and said, I'll have this in my office and they're all like, No, no, please, please, no. We've it doesn't got this go special there. and he's like, No, I'm having it. And every one of them is like that, you know. Um but the funny thing is that um Pamil Berg was telling me that every time uh, a prime minister loses office. They basically go in there at midnight and restore it to factory settings. They're like, now we're putting back this special oh. tub chair and the blah blah blah, so that when the next person comes in, they're like, this is the way it's supposed to be. And prime then minister. they just get rid of and it all and start it again. All. It's hilarious. It's like changing rooms for um, politicians. But there you go. But the point about the. Um, Design and and Pamil explained this to me because I'd always just thought, oh, just let them have a desk, like well, you know, mm. it's their mm. workplace. And she says, well, look, this building was designed to mean something. It was designed to be of the people, mm. and its ongoing, its consistency of design is to remind the occupants of all those offices that it is not about them. This is not your office. This is our office as a people. It's been designed and made by Australian artisans because this is a symbol of us all coming together and our awareness that this time in one year or five years or ten years, someone else will be in this office. It will not be you. And so you may not change things to suit yourself permanently because – it's not your office. Um, and that's a really interesting and great thing to remember, I think. Speaking of continuity, this is my most important question. Right. Oh, God. You filmed this over yeah. how long? Uh, ten months probably, start to finish. And as you said, you filmed for ten months and then you had to take all bits to create a narrative. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm going to ask, don't you? You are on the money. You are like – it's a little bit like the voice judges where mm-hmm. they have to pick an outfit – for the whole audition process, and which I imagine takes weeks to film. I really smell bad. By how the end. did you choose? How many outfits did you choose, and how did you keep track of what you were meant to wear for what things? So, what we made, we made a decision in the first place that we wouldn't try and be in the same outfit every single day because it would be crazy. We just tried to keep things pretty plain and dark. So, I have um, one. This great willow jacket. I was going to say, I thought it was willow. Yeah. It's, it and looks I've, like a black suit. Yeah, it's not. It's actually like an, a pair of pants that I've had for years. And I think when we started filming, we kind of like were so busy negotiating. We're like, we'll get to wardrobe later. I'll just start out by, I'll just wear my favourite black pants. Mm. Um, they're kind of like a harem, They're almost like man jump repellers. Pa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they're man repellers. Harem pants, yeah. um, And this great willow jacket which is stretchy of course it's a discontinued line because willow is no longer in business so i bought it on ebay so it's somebody else's willow jacket i don't know who's um and of course then after a while i just that became sort of the outfit how long ago did you buy it on ebay um probably about a year ago i think it could be mine get out of town because i looked at it and i thought (laughs) that's like the willow jacket that i sold no. I think that could be my willow jacket because we'd be about the same size. And I looked at it and I thought, <laughs> that is I wish I hadn't sold that jacket. <laughs> oh, my God. All right. I'm going to bring it in and we'll have a Cinderella. That's moment. Actually, fantastic. You will not want to have any part of no, your body touch that jacket because it was so funny. Like the further we got in this process, like and the pants, they used to be my favourite pants. And it's now like after, I just want to burn after, them. After um, maternity, when you just want to set fire to everything you know, wore for nine months. These were really months. my favourite pants, but actually, there's actually a hole in the leg now. So we had to shoot, you know. So how many was, days did you have to wear that outfit? Oh, uh, I, I, w- I would have worn that outfit for at least a month, you know, in just end-to-end days. And it just kept getting dry cleaned at the end of the week and I'd, like, have a top on underneath so it wouldn't get too stinky. And I also had a black dress, which actually is also recycled. It was a dress that I first wore to interview Malcolm Turnbull for Kitchen Cabinet. And I just think we got so obsessed with the, you know, it was a really hard shoot to coordinate because, Mm. you know, you're trying to catch everything. You don't know what the story is going to be. You're just trying to use your intuition, you know, to... um, to go to what seems interesting but also something that will be sustainable and cut together into a good story. So that was so absorbing that I think we kind of, you know, didn't really quite 
get onto the whole wardrobe You've issue, got a great but... pair of black collots in there too. Oh, yeah. It takes a very, very particular type of person to pull off a collot. <laughs> I have several with pairs a of flat. Collot. I love a collot. And it was great. Thank you very much. I mean, they're probably yours too, I No, I don't, they. don't. I bet I wouldn't but, buy them. Um, yeah, they were, it was quite disgusting to wear the same clobber and I, I feel sad that I'll never feel the same way about uh, my favourite no. pants and your jacket. And my jacket. Yeah. Maybe you should put it back on eBay and I'll buy it back. <laughs> and also hey, you know, they, those willow jackets are holding their value very well. Oh, they do. They're because they're stretchy, they're brilliant. Yeah, they're really good why, and also there's like a couple of people like Sam Maiden from Sky mm. has got like she's got one in every colour. That's how I got on to because I went, that is an awesome jacket. Because it's got really good shoulders. It, does it have says, really good shoulders. "Hi, I have defined so- shoulders." And it comes up here, so you don't need to wear anything underneath. Correct. It. But um, also your hair, I noticed, because <laughs> you have got a hair continuity nightmare on your head. Exactly. And so in the end, we just decided up. let it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely up. But I mean, you can still see. You know. <laughs> between scenes you're like hang on a minute whoa there's a sort of curl that's there and now it's not there i mean i have tricky hair it's just never going to be good for continuity yeah exactly do you know what that your clothes <laughs> were just a, a delightful little side dish on this extraordinary show i'm just forget game of thrones i'm just desperate for the next episode to come out and you haven't finished editing have you no, i better let you go we're just editing the blood wedding scene now so <laughs> <laughs> thank you Mia. bye Thanks for listening to No Filter. Watch The House with Annabelle Crabb on iView Now or every Tuesday at 8pm on the ABC. You can buy Annabelle's book The Wife Drought and her cookbook Special Delivery, which is all about things to bake and take to a friend's house in a wicker basket like Little Red Riding Hood. You can also uh, buy her quarterly essay about Malcolm Turnbull, which is called Stop at Nothing, Or perhaps you want to buy my book, Work Strife Balance. Well, if you just go to the iBooks at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia. And this is where you can also subscribe to all our other shows in one place because what woman does not like efficiency? You can buy things, you can download things, you can subscribe to things, just all the things in one place, which is iBooks at apple.co forward slash Mamma Mia. While you're there, you might want to try our TV podcast, The Binge. This week, our hosts, Laura and Claire, talk to the most sought-after actress in Australia right now, Jessica Murray. She's in The Wrong Girl and she was in Love Child and it's a really good interview, that one. And on our Family Life podcast, This Glorious Mess, which I told you about a little bit earlier, Holly and Andrew this week speak to Michael Carr Gregg. He's the adolescent health expert about how not to raise a boofhead son. He's got a new book called Prince Boofhead. And apparently Andrew gets quite defensive because he doesn't think his teenage son is a boofhead. But maybe I should listen to that or maybe it's actually too late for me. If you want more podcasts like this one, like No Filter, more interviews with fascinating people, well, I have actually spoken to Annabelle before in an earlier episode of No Filter. Um, where we talk about how Annabelle's not actually married to her partner and the husband of her three children, which I didn't know about her. Not that it matters. Um, Not that there's anything wrong with not being married. Some of my best friends aren't married. And also, I spoke to Annabelle's very close friend, Lee Sales, who, uh, well, we won't talk about Lee's marital status. That's something for the public record that's been quite written about enough. I also spoke to Lindy West, Cameron Daddo, Nigella Lawson, Naz Campanella, Lisa Wilkinson and Roxy Jasenko and Jackie Lambie and about a hundred and so others. So much interview goodness. And if you want all of our podcasts in one place and you want to make sure you can see all the feeds really easily because sometimes iTunes crashes, don't you find? Sometimes my podcast app crashes. You should download the Mum and Me podcast app, which never crashes and is also pink. If you want to suggest a guest or just ask me a question, you can call the pod phone on 02 899 9386. You might be like the lady who had to pull over her car and tell us that she'd been listening to um, my No Filter interview with David Gillespie about psychopaths. And one of the things I asked him was, um, "What hap- like, do psychopaths have children? What happens when psychopaths become parents? Because not all psychopaths are like murderers. Most psychopaths aren't. Most psychopaths are just people living in the world in jobs with families and with children and it was so interesting he he talked about all the sort of how a psychopath parents and um 
how to know if you do have a psychopath parent or grandparent, as someone I know discovered after listening to that pod. And uh, a lady was driving in the car listening to it on a road trip and had to pull over and call the pod phone and say, oh my God, my mother is a psychopath. I've just realized this after 20 years of therapy. This is why she is how she is because she's a psychopath and now it all makes sense. So that's a really good episode. We've had um, absolutely record downloads on that one. David Gillespie, it's just a little bit back in your no filter feed if you go and have a look if you happen to miss it. Plus in uh, Tell Me It's Going to Be Okay, which is our Trump podcast, if you're interested in all things Trump. Um, I did a special episode uh, with David Gillespie about Trump and whether Trump's a psychopath. Um, if you're not a phone call person, you can always email us at podcast at mamamia.com.au. We'd love to hear from you. We read all your emails. Today's show was produced by my partner in No Filter Crime, Eliza Ratliff, for the Mamma Mia Women's Network. I'm Mia Friedman. See you on the internet.